presented by Caltech. What I want to tell you about is a link between compensation of managers and formation of prices. Why is there such a link? Well, because of the simple fact that the way managers are paid influences how much risk they take. And how much risk they take, in turn, influences how the prices will be formed. For example, if somebody is paid a fixed amount of cash as salary for the rest of their career, they don't care much one way or another. But if you pay them with a performance bonus or you, or you pay them by a stock on a company or options on a stock, that will change their risk attitude. Why is this important? Well, we all remember the unfortunate crisis, financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And one reason for that crisis was excessive risk taking. And one reason for excessive risk taking was uh, the compensation, the structure of the compensation that was incentivizing market participants to take too much risk. And if we understand better these links, we can, in the future, reduce the size and the frequency of, of, future, of future financial crises. And of course, that's good for all of us, making our financial lives more stable. We have to worry less about uh, retirement savings, about savings for college, uh, and any other investments. But even, even uh, away from the crisis events, from day-to-day -day trading, we really want to understand also how the prices are formed. And again, they are formed uh, from the trading of portfolio managers, and the trading of portfolio managers will be influenced by the way they are paid. And finally, at the level of a firm, high-level executives and managers decide how a firm will be structured, how it will be financed, and this, again, these decisions are partially driven by their compensation packages. So, why, why is Caltech a good place to study these things? We are small, we have few researchers in finance, however, each one of us brings a very distinct expertise and a very distinct perspectives to problems like this. We want to use economic theory of contracts and incentives to build appropriate mathematical models to make theoretical predictions. And while doing this, we want to have the perspective of behavioral and neuro finance and economics, which tells us how exactly people make economic decisions. And after we have the theory and the theoretical predictions, we want to test the theory in the lab, we want to do experiments. And once we collect data from the experiments, we need to analyze those data using statistical and econometric techniques. All of these methodologies, we have great strengths at Caltech. For example, experimental economics, uh, Caltech has played a key role in developing this methodology, uh, especially my division, almost for as long as it's been in existence, which, by the way, is exactly 50 years this year. And as it happens, just yesterday, in the building across in Baxter, Professor Vernon Smith, a Caltech alum and a Nobel Prize winner for uh, his contributions to experimental economics, gave a talk on the history of this methodology. Let me then show you a project, a problem, on which we applied all these tools. A classical question in financial economics is, if you have traders in the market, how will the prices form? And in the simplest model, traditional classical model, it is assumed that the agents that trade, they trade between each other and they are rational, fully rational. And under some assumptions, you get, as a result, that the prices will be efficient. And by efficient, I mean roughly uh, prices of different assets will not, neither be too high nor too low relative to each other. And what we want to ask is, well, what if these, if investors don't trade directly with each other, what if they trade by investing their money in mutual funds, basically trading through portfolio managers? 
which is for the most part what happens in the real world today. And also, well, what if they are not fully rational? What would happen then? So we started this project, six collaborators, six co-authors, which actually for finance is an unusually high number of co-authors, but we wanted to have these different perspectives, different expertise, and we found them all at Caltech. At the beginning of this project, all six of us were either faculty members at Caltech or graduate students at Caltech or, or former Caltech students. And what we did is we inspired or uh, having insights from economic and finance theory, we built a quantitative model, we got our theoretical predictions, and then we went to do experiments. So uh, that was the most fun part, so I'm going to tell you about uh, experiments rather than the theory and the math behind it. And how did we do it? We had two groups of Caltech students, 30 of them acting as, in, uh, as portfolio managers. Think of them as 30 different mutual funds in which you can invest. And then the rest was 70 or 80 uh, investors, again, Caltech students. And we did this through six weeks. Once a week, there would be trading. And uh, the investors would have to decide how much of their assets to allocate across different managers, across different funds. And they, were, they could change their, they could rebalance their portfolios every week based on the information they received from the previous week, from the performance of the funds in the previous week. This is some of the results, what I'm going to show you. So what we did, we measured the efficiency of prices uh, in these experiments. How did we do that? The way the experiment worked, there were three possible outcomes in each week, basically tossing a coin with three sides, and nobody knew what the outcome will be, and the profits and losses would depend on those outcomes. The managers, after they get assets from the investors, they would trade with each other. If they agree, if a manager buyer and a manager seller agree on a price, that price would be recorded, and from those prices, we could compute uh, the uh, weight that managers put on these three possible outcomes, on the three sides of the coin. Okay? And that's, those weights is what is shown here in these graphs for the six weeks. And the basic theory, the efficiency theory that predicts efficient prices, corresponds to week three. Okay? It happens so that under uh, our design of our experiment, the red dots should be above black dots, above the blue dots. However, week one, if you look at it, that's not the case. But okay, week one, that was learning. Neither investors uh, nor managers were familiar with this setup, with this experiment. Week two, uh, the, the learning helped. Uh, they, the prices started to be efficient, red in the top, black in the middle, blue at the bottom, uh, especially as the time goes by. Week three, perfect, according to the theory. But then, the last three weeks, what do you see? It's a mess. Yeah? And that's what we first thought when we looked at the data. Well, this is a mess. We don't know what's going on. These are Caltech students, but they don't really seem to be very rational. So something strange. <laughs> well, what was the main reason for this? We dug into data. We did some statistical analysis. And this is what came up. In this experiment, managers were paid in such a way that they were incentivized, they had incentives to take high risks. And some of them took extremely high risk by betting all the assets they were, uh, they were managing on one event. Okay? So instead of diversifying across the three possible outcomes, they would bet on just one of them. And some of them got lucky. Right? They bet everything on an event which got realized and made a lot of money for their investors. And what happened, many of the investors exhibited what's uh, called the herd behavior in finance, which means they were chasing returns, disregarding potential risks. Well, because they, they saw some of the managers making a lot of money in the previous week, so many of them put most of the assets uh, in those funds, in those few, few funds uh, that the uh, successful managers were running. 
So now, not only you don't have 70 investors trading with each other, you don't even have anything close to 30 managers trading to each other. Now you have only the few managers who happened to be lucky in the previous week controlling most of the assets and running the trades. Okay? And this is, this is really what happened. This is the uh, main conclusion was, if you have this combination of managers which have incentives, which are paid in such a way that they have incentives to take high risks, in combination with investors which are not fully rational, even being students here, the, it's, you know, the combination uh, was fatal in this case in the sense that the market efficiency collapsed. Okay. Let me, so that was the, the main conclusion of this experiment and this project. Let me mention uh, for in the last couple of minutes uh, projects which we are looking at now and we are thinking of doing also in the future, related projects. But they are more on the corporate finance side. This is this third question which I mentioned before, which was how does executive compensation influences the structure and functioning of firms? Because it does, because it influences how the executive will make, uh, the CEO will make decisions, and this is influenced by how he's paid. Again, going to classical theory and classical models, in the simplest model, it is assumed that the CEO controls the return of the company and aggregates total risk of the company. It is also assumed that the uh, uh, managers and the shareholders are all fully rational. What we want to ask is, well, what if uh, the manager can also influence individual risk components, okay? Uh, maybe, which in reality they can, uh, maybe they can influence how much the firm is exposed to global risk, how much it is exposed to the industry risk of the industry in which the firm is operating, how much it's going to be exposed to other specific risks. Uh, also, the second question we want to ask is, well, what happens if the manager or shareholders are not fully rational? The terminology is they have behavioral preferences. And finally, what if, as it is often case in practice, what if their compensation is structured in such a way that they care more about relatively short-term prospects of the company and not about the long-term? Okay. And we have some theoretical results on that, some intuitive results, for example, that uh, the manager should be paid based not only on the returns of the firm, uh, but also on the riskiness of those returns. And not only that, but also at the relative level of that riskiness relative to other returns, for example, of the firms in the same industry or even the global market, or let's say, if it's a portfolio manager, his returns compared to the returns of the US stock index like S&P 500. And we would like to do these things, again, using these different perspectives that uh, we can at Caltech. And this is not just for this for this problem that I just described to you, which is the problem of finding out what makes financial agents tick, uh, it's other social science problems that we are dealing with at Caltech and that we are studying. All of them we want to study and we do study by, by taking insights from the theory. In my case, it was economics and finance theory, but it could be some other social science theory, it could be political science. So based on those insights, we build mathematical models, we make theoretical predictions, we do experiments, collect data, analyze the data, and get to our conclusions, okay? And, well, we believe that is how it should be done. Thank you very much for your attention.